All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. It is 12 o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today for Medicine Grand Rounds. Glad to see many in the room, but also many joining us virtually as well. Uh, today, we have a very special lecture and a very special guest speaker. Uh, today, we unveil a new endowed lectureship in the department supported by Dr. Kurt Fried, entitled the Kurt R. Fried Endowed Lecture in Therapeutics. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dr. Fried uh, before I introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Fried is the former division head of clinical pharmacology and toxicology, and he is professor emeritus in the DOM. He spent his entire career focusing on translating science into practice, epitomizing what we call translational research. A few highlights of his storied career. Dr. Fried performed the first fetal dopamine cell transplant in Parkinson's disease in the United States. This early experiment showed much improvement in dopamine levels in animal models, but also in human models as well. He then followed his arc of progressive scientific inquiry, performing the first randomized control trial of this therapy in humans. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1999 and truly paved a way for a new therapeutic in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Fried then extended his work, examining the regeneration of dopaminergic neurons from human stem cells. This work was recognized through several patents and intellectual property disclosures. And towards the end of his remarkable career, he began to work on phenylbutyrate as a key therapeutic agent for Parkinson's disease. He has thus left a lasting legacy of discovery uh, of the bench to care at the bedside. We are truly grateful to him for this endowed lectureship as a way of honoring his life's work and bringing pioneers to the Department of Medicine for Grand Rounds. Please join me in a round of applause for thanking Dr. Freed. Uh, Kurt, I know you're listening. Uh, Dr. Fried is away on international travels. Uh, he is currently in Munich, Germany. He promised me he's not having beers right now, um, but I thank him for being here and for his gift to the Department of Medicine. And now it is my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Robert Califf, who serves as the FDA Commissioner for the United States and is our inaugural lecturer today. Uh, I could tell you a lot about Dr. Califf and take up this entire hour, so I will keep it brief. Uh, Dr. Califf earned his MD from Duke University School of Medicine. He overlapped with our very own Dean, Dr. John Sampson. He then completed residency at the University of California, San Francisco, and in 1983, returned back to Duke for his cardiology fellowship. Following his training, Dr. Califf joined faculty at Duke. He rose through the ranks to professor with tenure. At Duke, he was recognized with many honors, including the Donald F. Fortin professorship from 1999 to 2019. He was named Associate Vice Chancellor for Clinical Research from 1995 to 2006, Vice Chancellor for Clinical Research from 2006 to 2011, and then the Vice Chancellor for Clinical and Translational Research from 2012 to 2015, and the Vice Chancellor for Health Data Science. So a lot of leadership roles at Duke. Prior to joining the FDA in 2022, Dr. Califf also served as Head of Medical Strategy and a senior advisor at Alphabet, contributing to strategy and policy for Verily Health Sciences and for Google Health. We are in for a real treat today from someone who understands regulations, ethics, healthcare, quality, and safety from multiple dimensions. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Califf. Thanks so much for the uh Kind introduction, and it's good to be back uh, in Colorado, where it's a lot of, you know, I have a lot of family, uh, two sons and their uh, families uh, between Denver and Breckenridge, getting into ski season, and uh, if you happen to break your leg or something up in Breckenridge, my son Tom is uh, head of trauma and the ski patrol doctor, so he'll be right there to pick you up off the slopes and make sure that you're okay. Um. Okay, so this is the key to CME, as I understand it. And what I'm gonna do is to try to race through a set of slides that are mostly pictures and tell a few stories that I hope will provoke some discussion um, at the end. And I'm gonna really try to make uh, time for discussion. So um, I'm very interested in what you all think. I've had a good visit already so far. I wanna start and end by pointing out that, um, you know, it's great to get the invitation to come for this particular lecture, and it happened to coincide with a problem that um, is a really big deal, I think, for our country and an opportunity for people in Colorado, and that's One Health. And I'm so used to saying One Health and people in, 
human medicine look at me like, what are you talking about? Um, uh, as you're probably aware, we uh, are in the midst right now of an outbreak of avian influenza in cattle. Um, it has had a big impact on Colorado. And interesting, Colorado is the only state out of the entire uh, United States that has handled this effectively, um, in my view, with a really important collaboration between uh, the State Department of Public Health, the Veterinary Service for the state, uh, and the rest of the state government. But one simple way to think about One Health, and that's really the intersection of health interests between human beings, animals, agriculture, and the environment. It, it all comes together. And to the extent we treat it as entirely separate, we're not gonna get the job done given what we have now. So just think about this. When uh, we first heard about the outbreak in Texas and a few other states, um, we were faced with a dilemma in the federal government in that the FDA is accountable for milk safety. And it turns out the virus in these cows is concentrated in the milk. Um, but the USDA uh, is in charge of the cows, uh, the regulation of the cattle. And the CDC is in charge of the regulation of the farm workers, their health, and also uh, the possibility of extension of this. Uh, this particular virus has been on the top of the list of pandemic risks for a long time now. So it's something we're very concerned about. So get this to work at every level. We really need a collaboration across these different interests with different levels of accountability with their own, within their own silos, so to speak. Um, and you're in a great position because you have a tremendous veterinary school right up the road, the world's most uh, important diagnostic lab run by the CDC, also in Fort Collins, and of course, this tremendous uh, human uh, medical complex here. So I'll end just mentioning that again. But for the main part of today's talk, here's sort of the bottom line if you want to sort of snooze through the rest. Um, in my job at FDA, it's really kind of fun. I, I can talk to people all around the world and they are frankly envious of the United States. We are leading the world in creation of new technologies, the main remit of the FDA, the safety and efficacy of products of various types uh, that could improve health. Unfortunately, we're far behind in losing ground now compared with other high income countries in longevity and healthy longevity, despite spending more money than anybody else on these issues by far. Now we regulated FDA the products with some authority to also regulate how these products are used in particular situations when Congress gives the FDA authority. And by the way, I'm not vying to have authority over this. I'm just pointing out something that leads to the main point of the talk. You are responsible for the practice of medicine and public health in the US. It's largely self-regulated, it's fragmented, it's increasingly controlled by financialization of the system. And there's a, a corollary in other parts of our remit that aren't directly uh, medical care related, the uh, food and tobacco, where the um, advent of very large industrial strength um, industries have an enormous impact on what happens with what we eat and how tobacco products are used. There is a massive amount now of misinformation and loss of trust and confidence in all of our societal institutions, including you all, as I'll discuss. But your behavior and what you choose to do about it, um, I think is really the critical element here. Um, after all, you're here to find the truth and promote it. And we have a massive enterprise in the world and in this country, which is actively working um, against the concept that there's even such a thing as expertise. Um, uh, for those of you who have studied long and worked to get your degrees. All right, so quick, first here's a run through of the FDA mission. Um, we regulate about 20 cents to 25 cents of every dollar spent in the US in terms of the industries that are involved. Um, a large part of what we do is food. People tend to forget that the app and FDA is for food. We regulate 80% of the food supply. Simple way to think about it that Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, taught me is that Agriculture Department regulates barnyard animals and catfish, and FDA regulates everything else that's in the food supply. Um, you might ask why catfish? It's because the catfish growers, they're mostly farmed got mad at the FDA and went to Congress and got a law passed moving catfish to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
Um, but we also regulate cosmetics, and we just have a new set of laws that give us some authorities in cosmetics. You may not think this is much of a uh, medical issue, but um, the quiz is how many cosmetics does the average woman use in the United States per day? The answer is 12. How many cosmetics does the average man use in the U.S. every day? The answer is six. But if you think about it, shampoo, deodorant, um, all sorts of things we put on our skin that are absorbed. And we're, there are some major public health problems related to things like formaldehyde in hair products and concerns about long-term cancer risk. We also have the Center for Veterinary Medicine, probably the most underappreciated part um, of the FDA. Uh, you think about uh, precision medicine and the human species, we have 3,000 species that we're accountable for, the drugs, devices, and um, other uh, products, and also the use of these animals as uh, food, which is something we share with the agriculture department. Drugs you all know about, devices obviously undergoing a radical change now because of changes in engineering and also the um, incorporation of AI and digital algorithms into devices. Biologics undergoing a major transformation. I just point to gene editing. And one of the really fun things about being an FDA commissioner, when you say gene editing, I could talk about um, children with rare disease, but I could also talk about plants and growing resilient plants uh, for the agriculture of the future, given the enormous climate changes. Or we could talk about um, animal models of human disease, or we could talk about even gene editing in mosquitoes, which is gonna be a big deal in the near future because of the rapid growth now of mosquito-borne diseases due to uh, climate change. And the last part of our armamentarium is uh, tobacco, which I'll also mention. But then there's what do we do with these? Uh, what, what is our mission for these products? Number one, of course, is protecting the public health, assuring safety and efficacy of um, products to the extent we're um, enabled to do so by law. Um, tobacco has its own special set of issues because it is the main thing that we regulate that has no human health benefit. And so most of what we regulate, like food and medical products, the presumption is that the industry is oriented towards improving human health. Here we have regulation that was put in place specifically because the only question is how many people are going to be killed or disabled um, by the use of tobacco products, given the framework of regulation that's allowed. Um, and then uh, right there with uh, protection of uh, public health is promoting innovation. And there's always this balance that we have to struggle with. It raises a lot of the questions. And then uh, one of the hardest things is educating the public about the uh, using science-based information uh, to uh, improve uh, the appropriate use of uh, the products that we regulate. You think about 340 million people speaking different languages and having different views of the world, this is really something that is very much um, underfunded and underappreciated in terms of a difficult mission. But this is also where you really have the dominant role um, as uh, intermediaries that actually deliver the products to people. And then finally, one that was impossible to talk about really in 2015, 16, people look very quizzical on, this is the same slide I used to say, but now that we've been through the pandemic, um, people now have a better appreciation that unless we're ready and spending money on the infrastructure and preparedness on a daily basis, when the next catastrophe hits, whether it's a nuclear war or a tornado or a hurricane or a pandemic, um, this is a major part of our mission that we spend a considerable amount of time on. Um, I'd refer you to an article we recently wrote in a cardiology journal where we listed all the things we hope that you would do. I'm not gonna go through them here and in your interactions with the FDA, but I would just say, um, I would hope that a significant proportion of you would look for ways to interact with the FDA because what I'm trying to get across here is we go so far and then there's a handoff to what you do and the ways that you interact with the industries that make products in terms of how they're used. All right, now, for the most depressing part of the talk, at least for me, but hopefully inspiring for you all to uh, redouble your efforts, efforts. From the perch of being on the sort of executive committee of health and human services in the US government right now, how does the US health status look? Well, I could have picked a lot of different 
ways to show this, but the Commonwealth Fund just came up with its latest rankings. And compared to other high income countries, we're a distant last place. It's not even like we're in the running for next to last. We are so far behind the next worst country in terms of health system performance that um, it's, it's really quite remarkable. And for that lousy result, we're spending um, about twice as much money per person uh, to get this result. And um, if you look at the ratio of those, we are just not even on the same chart. We're just in a very different place compared to all these other um, countries. I just growing up, I never liked to be in last place. I always thought it was better to be on the first place team, but we're not there um, as a country when it comes to health status. And you might say, so you're talking about health system performance. Let's talk about uh, alive and dead people. We have more avoidable deaths and shorter lives by far than any other high income country and we're losing ground uh, by the day actually in this regard. It's all encapsulated on this one slide that I show over and over and it gets updated every year. It doesn't look any better as time goes on. If you go back in the lower left hand corner to 1970, we look like all other high income countries. Over time, we have migrated in a unique direction and I had English teachers in high school that said only use unique when you mean one of a kind uh, we are unique in spending so much more money for such a worse result when it comes to life expectancy. It was really put into um, perspective for me. I had the privilege of helping to start a medical school in Singapore. And then, um, you know, years later, last year, we needed to go to India to work on generic drug issues. And we stopped in Singapore. I got to see my old friends. And they requested an urgent meeting to spend a half a day to discuss their major public health crisis. Their major public health crisis is that half of their teenagers are expected to live to be age 100. And they're trying to figure out what do you do between ages 70 to 100 to um, keep people interested in life and having meaningful lives, not how do we keep them healthy? They're already doing that pretty well. So this is like a really striking difference. It's a little off humor, but one of our people literally did say, we've solved that in the U.S. It's called guns and opioids. We don't have that problem. But this is a call for all of us to get serious about this and uh, do something. But of course, this is not an issue which is um, homogeneous across the United States. And this is just a slide to make the point that all of you know that what I call the traditional disparities are still very important in this country by race and ethnicity, that there is a, a big difference. And COVID um, had differential effects in different phases of the pandemic. But the net effect at the end of COVID was that we still have very significant differences in life expectancy as a function of race and ethnicity um, in this country. And of course, geographically, it's not uh, similarly distributed. So um, I'm preaching to you guys in Colorado, but you're like the, you know, close to the top of the best states in terms of um, how these health parameters are going. And yet, if you look within Colorado, you've got all the same issues going on as you get uh, outside the urban areas to the rural areas. But it's my part of the country, the southeast, that is having the biggest trouble. But um, if you look at it more closely, um, it really boils down to a large extent to a growing wealth gap in this country and the health consequences of having less money. Um, and also um, looking at a rurality um, as an issue and what's just, you know, a huge difference in the likelihood of dying early um, if you're living in a rural area and have uh, poor financial status. And education has a lot to do with it. You could basically say, just take Denver out of the equation and look at the rest of Colorado and you'd see the same um, pattern. So um, the, the disparities that are really growing by leaps and bounds in this country, the old ones are still there and they need attention. The ones that are growing by leaps and bounds are living outside of a metropolitan area, having less wealth and having a lower level of education. And I'm not here to talk about politics, but I probably don't have to tell you that these political issues and these social determinants have become deeply intertwined 
in our society, which makes it very difficult to figure out what to do in a public health sense. So I'm gonna give you my list of things that I hope you'll uh, focus on. In addition, let me just say at the beginning, the number one job of uh, people that are uh, um, clinicians or scientists in a uh, medical center is to do a good job on your primary mission, taking good care of patients, discovering new things and applying those new things in translational research. So these are some things that I hope you'll, some of you will pay a lot of attention to in the interim. Uh, I hope you'll make combating misinformation and disinformation a priority at every level, the system as a whole, uh, the profession, um, and the individual level. What do I mean by this? Right now, we are inundated 24 by seven in an uh, internet-based culture uh, with social media with a lot of misinformation, which is basically your next door neighbor or the a person uh, in your social group that has an idea about something, something they believe and put out there, uh, intending no harm. But there's also a growing amount of disinformation. That's purposeful misinformation with the intention of misleading or doing harm. And um, there are many, many examples of this. I'll say more about it in a minute. And then malinformation, which is also growing and in many respects has now become an international um, type of subliminal warfare that's going on where countries are, are actively trying to identify um, areas of disagreement within our society and then promoting ideas that promote more disagreement, regardless of which side it may um, be on. If you have spare time or if you need bedtime reading, I would urge you to read these three books. I'd highly recommend Francis Collins' book that just came out. Um, it has a somewhat religious trend because he's a person that tries to reconcile religion and science. And I, th you know, I'll, I'm personal friends with Francis. I think he does an amazing job of this. But the book is an easy read. It's an audio audio book. Uh, I'm not selling the book, but um, it's very contemporary about what's going on right now and some different ways to think about it. Peter Hotez, you probably know about, who's uh, um, a, an infectious disease person who's developed some very important vaccines, um, has a child who um, has autism and has had to um, personally defend the idea that vaccines do not cause autism, but also in the midst of the pandemic has come under tremendous fire by the misinformation crowd. And then the one I'm reading now, I'm not done with it yet, um, is by Harari called Nexus, and it's about the history of information networks. What happens um, when there's a sudden change in the basis for transmitting information to large numbers of people? Uh, things like the printing press, um, actually the development of going from telling stories to writing stories and writing. And um, the main point of it is, at least in his view, and I think he's probably right, Historically, every time one of those major changes happens, there is a period of darkness where the bad guys went out for a long period of time. If you think about the printing press, that, what a wonderful thing. But what happened right after the printing press came out was uh, the, one of the darkest periods in the history of Europe when the witch hunts and uh, they're all kind of interesting stories about how all that got promoted because lies travel much faster and are easier for people to uh, read than truthful statements. To tell the truth uh, in mass communication takes a lot of work. This is not new. So these are, these are real advertisements that used to exist. There actually was snake oil sales and snake oil salesmen, they advertise. But if you think about it, they advertise in journals or newspapers that have very limited uh, distributions. Uh, that's obviously what's changed. And it's sort of an interesting part of history, at least if you believe Danielle Allen, that this is actually part of the basis of the Constitution. The reason, one of the reasons we're a Federalist society is that there was a belief that you could prevent um, dangerous factions from taking over because of the geographical differences that would exist, which would create a break, basically, in the promotion of dangerous ideas and would lead to a situation where these different regions would settle their differences by elected politicians. Well, I probably don't need to tell you, having worked at Alphabet, uh, at the time I worked there, there were 11 products that had over a billion 
users per month. So what used to be take months to years to settle now uh, gets out to the entire world in a time of minutes. Um, Renee DeResta, who spent a good part of her career studying this, um, had this good set of slides that uh, was used by the American Board of Internal Medicine that I thought really told the story in kind of a nice, simple way. As we went from uh, television and newspapers to zero cost publishing on the internet, the ability to consolidate audiences using algorithms and feedback, and then targeting people based on their characteristics to get particular messages to particular people, the world has changed. And this has produced network effects where if we live within networks uh, that are segregated from each other by prior beliefs and reinforced by algorithms. And remembering that the, um, if an algorithm is just an artificial intelligence that is tuned to a metric. The metric for algorithms on the internet has been engagement. That is, how, like, how long does the person sit there looking at the screen? Because what that does is the amount of advertising that the internet company makes is directly proportional to how many people look at it for how long. So it's a very simple way to tune an algorithm. It doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have an intention, but the net effect of this is uh, the, re the reinforcement of things and what's now very well known, and it goes way back uh, to other forms of communication, but people get more engaged with negative information that creates an emotional response. So what are the algorithms going to do if their only purpose is to increase engagement? They're going to fortify uh, the components of communication that have a negative effect. As I think about this at FDA, given recent court decisions, we are limited to truthful statements written in um, English on sheets of paper that show up on the internet. Compare that with what is being shown here in terms of what people are being uh, exposed to. So the net um, effect of all this is that, um, and this very much relates to you all as you work in clinics or in communities to try to improve public health, influence and expertise have been decoupled. And that is the power to influence opinions lies with those who can most widely and effectively disseminate a message. It doesn't matter if the message is truthful. And it's very well shown that um, as one famous person said fairly recently, if you tell the same lie six times in a row, a very high proportion of people are gonna come to believe that it's true. And so, um, what used to be um, like Walter Cronkite on CBS is now a very fragmented set of communities that are separated from each other, um, self-reinforcing, where people who are attractive in this medium have sway over large parts of the people that you're seeing um, in your clinic. Well, the net effect of this, part of um, populism, and uh, Harari goes into this in some detail, a big part of populism is eroding confidence in expertise because expertise is built on the idea that we grow a body of knowledge that we agree upon as the truth. And that means that someone who's saying there is no, uh, that, that you should believe me, not the expert, has to really erode your confidence in that. And look at what's happened. This is the Gallup poll this year. Um, and notice at the bottom there, there's a big drop in confidence um, in the medical system that's currently um, occurring because uh, there's an active effort to have people believe that you are working for a, um, essentially a conspiracy, which is uh, pushing products and things on people which are um, not effective compared to alternatives that are being offered on the internet. Now, this is a spoof, but um, it, it actually has uh, uh, quite a bit of meaning in terms of what's actually occurring. So I like this statement, and this is from uh, um, most, most of you uh, are too young to remember Paul Starr and his writing, but this I think says a lot, and I think it's very important for people at a place like this to absorb what it really means. What is the basis upon which a person shows up in your clinic or your intensive care unit and has confidence that you're gonna try to do the right thing? Your basis for having authority um, is that their judgments and advice that are um, 
not idiosyncratic, but represent a community of shared standards. And this is something that if we don't actively reinforce that concept and what it means and try to avoid doing things that erode this view by acting idiosyncratically or in a way which doesn't show faith to the well-being of the patient, what I would call professionalism, if we don't exude that, uh, this is likely to be a losing battle. All right, now a few other things. That was the biggest um, tranche. Um, we got to get back to the basics. So if you look at it from my perch of what we regulate, I, I'm a cardiologist. I love medical products. It's fantastic. But what's really at the basis of this bad health status that we have in the U.S. is not that we don't have the next best stent. It's that people are eating the wrong thing. They're using too much tobacco and they're not getting good primary care in this country. Um, there is, you should know, an effort that is underway to try to move the cheese a bit, to quit giving the specialists the lion's share of the money and get more of it into primary care. So if there's students listening, I hope you'll actually consider, I'm a cardiologist, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm guilty, but um, let's just say we need people to go into primary care um, as a fundamental issue that's eroding our health status. A quick word about tobacco. Yes, we uh, have been successful compared to the peak when I started my career of just enormous numbers of young people dying from sudden death or cancer due to um, combustible tobacco. But we still have 30 million Americans using combustible tobacco today. And we have this onset of vaping um, issue, which is down this year. So I'm Proud of that, but a number of societal issues related to what to do with vaping products. And I always use this um, old slide just to um, make the point that as much as we may think as professionals, that's an old topic and we've conquered it. We haven't. 500,000 Americans will die of tobacco-related illness this year. And in terms of my job, let me just point out that we have three major FDA actions which are on hold right now for a variety of reasons. One, prohibiting the use of menthol in tobacco products, uh, a, a product which has been targeted at black people very purposely by the industry. Um, flavored cigars just sort of go along with that. Youth use cigars now more than they do cigarettes, which is kind of interesting. I wouldn't have thought that. And then we figured out what the level of nicotine is that is sub-addictive. And so it is possible to mandate a level of nicotine in tobacco products which is below the addiction level. Um, as you might imagine, this is not a favorite um, of the tobacco industry. So um, a lot going on there that I hope will have support from the community. Now, just quickly diet. And, you know, in One Health, going to Colorado State and seeing the extent of the agriculture there, I was at Cornell also, we started making a tour because we need to shore up the degree to which the traditional medical and public health communities are interacting with the agriculture and animal communities. We're just all interrelated by a whole variety of bacteria and viruses and we eat each other. I guess we eat animals more than vice versa, but um, mosquitoes bite both of us and transmit um, diseases in a really complicated ecosystem. But on the food side, Americans are just eating bad diets. Um, almost the vast majority of people are exceeding the limit for sugars for saturated fat um, and sodium. And remember that almost all the sodium is not from the salt shaker on the table, it's what's baked in to processed food. And if you look at this from the population perspective, our uh, youth, teenagers, are eating worse than anyone else. I guess that's not a shocker, but these are habits um, which are being ingrained in our society most unfortunately. And if you look at a ranking by country, we are leading the world by far in the eating of ultra-processed uh, foods. Um, and we have the most um, obesity in the world. Again, not a shocker, but what are we doing about it? And this may sound incredulous to you, but we're currently fighting a battle to get labels moved to the front of the package. As crazy as it may seem, a large part of the uh, Food industry thinks it's an imposition and too much of a burden to put the label on the front of the package where people would actually see it. Um, 
We're also redefining the word healthy to include the modern concepts of food. That is, if a package says healthy on it, you'll have to meet certain criteria for that to hold. Not everybody's in favor of that because that might cause some people to rethink what they're buying. Remember that most people when they shop, and I'm certainly an example, don't turn the package around and study the label. They're in a hurry. They have a lot of things to do. And so you need cues which are easy to read and simple and give people some basic information for repetitive day-to-day -day decisions. And we are making progress on a voluntary reduction in sodium. Remember, this is not the salt shaker. This is what the people that are selling things in grocery stores and convenience stores are putting into the food uh, up front. All right, we got to rub uh, on the medical products. We got to rub out the post market evidence generation system. This has been my career. We keep working on it. We're making some progress. We've got a long way to go. Um, the wake up call for me was, uh, gosh, 2009. We did, I thought, we're in cardiology, we're the evidence based medicine field. Um, we're just great. So we looked at our clinical practice guidelines and it turned out that less than 15% of our major recommendations are based on high quality evidence. So the people that um, I guess I'd say I trained said, okay, let's look a decade later, later, surely we're getting better. And guess what? We're not. And so what's happening here, it's not that there's not a lot of research being done, but a lot of it's not answering the key questions that are needed to know what to do with things in practice. And the rate of technological advancement in the US is much faster than the evidence generation system can keep up with it. So uh, we gotta work on this. It's not hard, we know what to do. The concepts are not hard, I should say. The practice has turned out to be extraordinarily uh, difficult. And from my visit here today, I'd say it's still very difficult um, in this system to get relatively simple studies done. I'll, I'll skip a slide there and, and just make the point that uh, for the most part, um, what happens pre-market is pretty much controlled by the FDA. So I take accountability for that. There's a law that says you can't put a medical product on the market unless the benefits outweigh the risks. But the key thing to know is that pertains to one indication in one population. That's all you have to show. We have no authority to require studies beyond that that answer all the questions that are still on the table at that point, like uh, which product is better? Um, how long should you give it? How do you combine treatments? What is actually the best dose? You don't have to have the best dose. You have to have a dose that works um, in, a, in a pivotal uh, clinical trial. And that's an area where there is no one uh, we, in control uh, we all have a stake in this, and I would argue you have the biggest stake because you're the ones that are applying these products, often in the absence of good knowledge about actually how they should be used and what should get preference in the system. Of course, we have this major advance now that everyone has electronic health records. This was a dream when I started out. It's getting better and better. It's no longer a technological issue to capture the data from electronic health records and claims data. What is an issue is the culture that we live in that leads to extraordinary hoarding of information and blocking of the sharing of data that's essential for reasons that I'll go into. So what we're very much hoping for at the FDA is a system where we go from a situation where before a product is on the market, we have these rigorous clinical trials and then it's a free for all. With occasional studies done, we do have authority if a safety problem is identified um, or if it's an accelerated approval that we can require a follow-on study. But we need to go, oops, let's see if I can make this go back. Nope. It's going the wrong direction. Darn, let's see. Yeah, it's, it goes forward no matter what, which button I push. So we can finish this lecture quickly. Oh, that's great. All right, thank you.
So we need to go to a system now where, um, there it goes. We need to go to a system where we're surveilling the electronic health records continuously. And then we add in pragmatic clinical trials to answer questions as close to real time as possible that pertain to the key questions that clinicians and patients have. A couple of interesting things about this. Um, knowing what happened when we recommended um, updated COVID vaccines was impossible in the US because of the um, data blocking and inability to share data. Even the CDC has to reach agreements with every single state and jurisdiction in order to harvest the data. All I had to do was just call Israel. They had the data in real time because all their electronic health records are combined into a constant ongoing view of what's happening to the entire population with regard to medical products. And the other point I would make is that um, uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is now requiring Medicare, CMS, to negotiate with pharma companies um, on the price of drugs once they reach a certain point and they're in a certain category. Well, now for the first time, CMS has a direct interest in this post-market space of doing good studies to get the evidence they need to figure out what the price of a drug uh, should actually be. So this is gonna be a big incentive for industry to, um, instead of using marketing and selecting trials just based on whether it um, ad, ad, adds to the uh, value of a product as an asset, to actually get involved in doing the kinds of studies that can be accepted by the government is justifying the cost of a drug. So a big area for you all to work on. Now, my one plea, which I've told everybody here, please fix the supply chain. It's ruining my life at the FDA. I did not become FDA commissioner to try to figure out where normal saline and D5W is hanging out in the system. So here's the basics just for you to know. We have hundreds of generic drug shortages a year. The lower the price, the greater the likelihood of a shortage. The exception is stimulants where it's controlled by the DEA. So there's a self-imposed shortage as a matter of dealing with addictive drugs. And anti-obesity me medicines where for the first time in history, as far as I know, there's an enormously profitable drug where the industry just can't make enough to satisfy the demand. That will eventually solve itself. You can guarantee if there's a buck to be made um, in the industry, they're gonna figure out how to make the drug. But the big issue is the generic drugs, where if there's not a significant pro profit, the companies don't want to be involved in making the product. That's not hard to understand, I don't think. Um, the key starting materials, which are petrochemicals for all of our drugs, are coming from China now. And that you all know what NIMBY means, uh, not in my backyard. And the reason for this is not just lower price. People don't want petrochemical plants in their backyard in the United States. We got to fix this. There's another term, banana. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's more complicated that relates to this. Um, most, uh, the largest proportion of our generic drugs are made in India. I'm all for that because there's 7.6 billion people who don't live in the United States that need high quality generic drugs, but we need to deal with this. Uh, our PPE, remember when we invested in bringing it back to the US? It's all gone back to China now. Um, we are, uh, only have one company left in the U.S. that makes syringes and stopcocks. All the rest is uh, made in China. And um, we had one plant go down and we were out of IV fluids for the entire country. Not a great way to run a system. Well, um, we have a white paper on this from Health and Human Services. And I just want to make one quick point. I think the major culprit in this is you guys. Um, you have heavily rewarded your supply chain people to get lower prices, regardless of the quality or the resilience of the system. And they're doing exactly what they're being told to do. Now, it gets laundered through this whole set of intermediaries here um, who are not regulated by anybody who work on behalf of you guys to get those lower prices. And the manufacturers out here, mostly in India, are saying, even in India now, for a lot of these, we can't make the product at the price that you're uh, commanding. So unless you give your supply chain people different instructions, I'm gonna spend, whoever the next commissioner is gonna spend a large part of his or her time 
chasing down over 200 shortages every year and having intermediate catastrophes. So this is a problem that needs your attention. And then finally, the last thing. Um, we're running, let's see, got a little bit of time, I think. The last thing um, to focus on, AI, which everybody wants to talk about. I love AI. I worked at Alphabet. I got to see all this happening. It was a lot of fun. But I think there's a really troublesome interface right now between healthcare professionalism, that is putting the patient first, and the financialization and fragmentation of the system that we're all experiencing. Now, some of you are too young to remember what this is. It's called a library, and it used to be where you went for information, you had to look it up one journal, and the great resident could make a, knew where the Xerox machine was to make a copy of the article for everyone. It's now been replaced by um, this, which um, is moving very rapidly and I'm radically enthusiastic about what it could potentially do. Uh, I mean, imagine your clinic visits without having to, uh, you could look at the patient and examine the patient instead of typing into a computer or uh, hunting and uh, clicking. And, but it not only does that, the ability to retrieve the world's entire information at one time has this amazing opportunity to help you make better decisions as you're talking um, with people. But the question is, the existential question I think is, um, this should reduce your clinic visits time by 50%. And the question is, what's gonna happen to that extra time? Are you gonna be told to see twice as many patients or are you gonna be told to actually spend time talking with your patients? And I've told several people this here today, a group I really respect tried a digital first clinic and it failed completely because guess what? People actually want to talk to you when they come to see you uh, in clinic. These are three great articles, I think, that explain this. I don't have, to have time to go through um, all of it. The second one is suboptimization, which we're all experiencing in the United States in every segment of society. This is actually my favorite article of all times. It's about a man who thinks he has pancreatic cancer, goes through the system, gets a Whipple, everything goes perfectly, everybody takes good care of him, they all say nice things. A year later, during the follow-up, someone discovers that he actually didn't have pancreatic cancer. So the entire system worked great, but the end goal of the, of the system didn't produce the product that was needed because everybody was doing their part of it, and there was no synthetic sum total. So uh, this failure to integrate is rampant in our system. You know, just try to get an appointment in primary care or get from one place to another um, in a medical center. Well, what does this have to do with AI? One of the most important things which preceded me at FDA is that if you have an AI algorithm, what you do in the pre-market phase of that algorithm is very important, but it's a small part of, of what needs to be done. The most important part is in the post-market phase. Once you put that, that algorithm into a clinical environment, everything changes. And so unless you validate that algorithm consistently, treat it like an ICU patient, you need to monitor and validate um, over the course of the algorithm. You can't depend on individual clinicians to do this. And I think the simple way to think about this, do you stop in the road and say, I'm not sure that that, um, map is telling me the right place to go? Probably not very often. You're not interrogating the AI that's behind the map that's, as you talk to your car, that's telling you where to go. There's just not time. This is a great article, I think, that goes through the human factors of why, depending on clinicians to get the algorithms right, is a big mistake. So what's needed is what's called local recurrent validation. I would say there's not a single health system in the US right now which is able to do this. But unless we implement this on a national scale, uh, we're going to have a big problem that people are going to be hurt by decision support algorithms that had good intention. But unless someone's tracking it, you're just not going to know what it's doing, whether good or bad. And um, an easy way to remember this, I, I went to Alphabet and there was this thing that happened with the flu algorithm that some of you remember. Um, they produced um, a predictive model really that was using what we would call AI now. And it was able to, in the first year, very accurately predict what was gonna happen with that uh, flu epidemic in terms of 
where the infection was happening and um, uh, how it was distributed around the world. Well, everybody said, we did a great job. Let's all go off and do something else. The next year, the thing completely fell apart. It just didn't work. And the whole reason is because a lot of different things change about the climate, the geography, the people. And unless you're tending that algorithm, much like a patient in the ICU, it can fall apart and you'll never know it unless you're actually uh, looking at it. The methods for doing this are known. The biggest impediment is that we don't share data across health systems. We are at the point now, thank goodness, where for an individual patient, I'm guessing here you can get on the portal and find a patient that went to Denver Health or whatever. But aggregate data, which is what you need to validate algorithms, is almost impossible right now in the US. And it's become the enterprise of private businesses that are selling the data in all kinds of ways that people don't understand. But that, I don't think, from our point of view at the US government, is not the way to do it. If you want to read more about what I think about this, we just had an article in JAMA last week. Um, I don't think it's um, anything spectacular, but it at least reflects what I think I've learned um, in this organization as I'm and in my previous career elements and how to regulate and think about uh, this amazingly positive uh, era. And let me come back to the health status. Um, this is a quote that um, I might put on my tombstone because every day at Google, there would be an engineer with a great idea and it, most of them turned out, you couldn't do them because, for a reason I'll say in a minute. But the ones that you could do, we spent huge amounts of time trying to make them uh, user-friendly for people um, who were disenfranchised from um, optimal use of the internet for all the reasons that you know. Um, but no matter what we did, it was, a health, it was a wealthy and highly educated who took advantage of the technology. So, this uh, Ed Young quote, technological solutions tend to rise into society's penthouses while disease is seeping to its cracks. I think it's a very fundamental property of digital technology that unless you have a conscious in, intention to fix it, it will not get fixed and it will exacerbate um, the disparities that we currently see. And I think that's what's happening right now to a large extent in our society. So our little effort to try to help us at the FDA, a way to think about this was the glass cockpit um, project. In the 1960s, every time an engineer, and I have a son who's a, who's a space physics PhD from Boulder, so he works on this kind of thing. Every time you could measure something new, it would just get put in a gauge and stuck in the cockpit somewhere. And pretty soon the pilots are saying, we can't fly the planes because we're not sure what to look at out of all the stuff that's in the cockpit. And so NASA did a massive project looking at human factors, came up with a standardized display, and it went from this uh, to something like, this is a little exaggerated, but something like this. So pilots get in planes and they know what to look at. Well, what's going on right now with our clinicians and patients as they're dealing with all this information and all kinds of apps that are not connected, um, often dealing with overlapping things. We don't have a glass cockpit. And so at FDA, we're now uh, embarking on a project we call Home as a Healthcare Hub. And the concept here is not only do we need primary care in every neighborhood, but we need the interaction of the, of the home, primary care, and then specialty care linked um, using digital technologies. And um, it's been really sort of fun to watch this happening. I, I can't, in my job, I can't spend a lot of time on it. But the industry is very much interested in it because now this brings all the technology that might be spent on the next great gadget for, gadget for high tech, um, especially medicine to the masses of American people who need help just to stay at home and uh, try to improve uh, their health. And so the idea is we're bringing in architects and all kinds of other people to create what we hope it will not be a federal government dashboard but sort of a method of bringing the industry together to create places where this technology can be brought together in a way in which a human being can interact with it and make uh, sense of it in a helpful way. So I think the summary of the digital part of this is we're at a, a crossroads right now where we can either use digital technology to make our disparities worse or we can use it to improve them. It's up to us uh, to try to make this happen. 
or as put by Steve Seinhubel, who um, is a colleague who was a, believe it or not, was a chemical engineer at Kodak in the last days of um, old fashioned uh, photography and saw it completely go away. Um, the question is out about what this digital technology is gonna do to the current. And, and you'll notice that most industries have been entirely disrupted or replaced. I don't think that's gonna happen in healthcare, but um, it's in the mix right now about how this is gonna happen. So back to the bottom line, um, we're way ahead of other countries in innovation and new technologies. We're behind our economic peers and the use of this technology um, to help people. I don't think it's mostly an FDA problem. I think it's mostly your problem. Um, I'll be back among you at some point. My, uh, I'm a political appointee, so my term ends. Um, and I think these, these uh, issues of fragmentation and financialization, where in essence you become an object of a financial spreadsheet whose goal is to optimize the profit of the system, um, unless you get into that equation, a dependent variable that says better patient outcomes and better lives for the clinicians, um, the, the direction of this is very uh, clear to me. Um, and misinformation is eroding uh, the entire system. You might think I'm pessimistic, I'm actually not. These things are self-correcting over time. I would just like it to be corrected for my kids and grandkids, not for several uh, generations later. So I'll stop there. I'm glad to uh, take any questions or disagreements that you may have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Califf, a, a thought-provoking, sobering uh, discussion. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. We have a few minutes. The audience has a hand over there, Dr. Jolly. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned drug pricing, which seems to be a big barrier to health. I'm wondering if there will be a point where the FDA will start to consider pricing in the approval process. Um, first of all, I do want to make the point. Uh, drug pricing is very important. The price of innovator drugs is uh, simply too high. That's my opinion. Over 90 percent of our prescriptions are now generic, and we have massive underuse of generic medications and supply chain problems, which is why part of the reason I focus on that. For FDA to consider price, Congress would have to pass a law. It's illegal for us to consider price right now in our statute. It's safety and effectiveness is our mandate. I would throw the question back to you. Um, ultimately, these drugs are being sold to you guys. So um why don't you demand lower prices now the intermediate between that contentious statement is the ira is telling cms now for the first time in history to negotiate uh, prices of a limited number of drugs um i i love the, the innovator drug industry in terms of the creativity and these products that have amazing effects um, but I don't think Americans should be the ones who are paying all the freight for the rest of the world to get access uh, to these drugs. So that's at least the way I look at it. But we would have to have a law pass for us to consider price. Other questions, Dr. Califf? Well, maybe I'll ask you a question. You mentioned data and um, EHRs and learning health systems and how we can truly validate what we think is real in a control setting. Who, who regulates that aspect of data sharing at the EHR levels? Uh, to me, it seems like data is power and locking it up is sort of their, the MO in many ways for companies to stay profitable. Is there, um, is there a, a path forward to have that be more democratic and perhaps allow us to do some of the validation work? Yeah, so the law says that the record belongs to the um, patient, not to the system. And there are now uh, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, um, based on the law that says that, now with penalties for people who block data, uh, a set of penalties are now being put in place. And there will be some exemplars for that, um, that uh, issue. There are a whole set of other related issues in the how you organize the data to make it useful when it's shared. And we're also working on that. There's a really fundamental issue of just extracting the data mm -hmm. and the terms that are used in the EHR 
and there's a big effort um, uh, at the Office of the National Coordinator um, to at least take a, we all have um, age, sex, race, um, blood, you know, vitals, drugs. Those are mostly codified already. So we just need, uh, that's gonna become a requirement that you collect that in a uniform way. Um, so I, I think it's underway. It's just gonna take a while. And as I said, we got the shadow industry right now, which is buying data from people like you all and then selling it back yeah. when it really ought to be just um, data that's available to make healthcare better. One last question from Dr. Zimmer. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, you didn't mention herbal medications or those over the counter um, type of supplements. Um, where do those fall right now in terms of regulation? I just recently noticed my teenager had purchased on his own something to help him grow taller. Um, and I wondered about the health um, regulation of those products. Um, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm um, skirting the issue, but <clears throat> let's separate things. Over-the-counter drugs actually are very highly regulated. So if it's a drug and the advertisement says to diagnose or treat a human disease, that's very highly regulated. You actually have to prove in clinical studies that a consumer can make a reasonably intelligent decision based on that information as opposed to having a intermediary prescriber, a doctor or a nurse practitioner. Dietary supplements are regulated by a law called DSHEA, which was passed a long time ago that prohibits the FDA from requiring evidence of efficacy. Um, and also there's no requirement that the manufacturers list all the ingredients that are in their supplements. We can only react if someone reports problems. So this um, I think is a big issue. Um, I have a whole solution to this, but Congress would have to act. Um, two other things I want to mention. One, um, there's a whole set of things now that just, I call them gas station drugs. These are not dietary supplements. They're um, sub-addictive or addictive substances like Kratom. Um, there's a law that uh, set, passed to help the farmers, mostly in the Southeast, to replace tobacco about hemp. But leave it to America, people have figured out how to take hemp, which by law is at a level of THC ingredient that's not, um, doesn't cause um, psychological changes. But guess what? You can manipulate hemp and get highly concentrated other um, cannabinoid products, which do affect that. These are being, if you go to a gas station in the Southeast, you'll see all these products proudly on display. So that's another issue. And then finally, I, I don't want to end with this one, but I have to mention, if you want to know the direction of dietary supplements, look at RFK Jr.'s tweets over the weekend. <laughs> and you can make your own decision as to what you think about that. Dr. Kelly, thank you for an inspiring thank you. talk. <laughs>